The scripture for this sermon is from the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because the time, the situation, and the message he felt forced to proclaim during his ministry was so depressing. Jeremiah's ministry occurred during the reigns of the last kings of the ancient nation of Judah, Josiah, his son Jehoahaz, who only ruled for three months before taken to Egypt as a prisoner, Jehoiakim, and then Jehoiachin, who only ruled for three months and ten days before he was taken prisoner and exiled in Babylon for the rest of his life. And finally, Zedekiah, who ruled for 11 years until he was captured by the Babylonians, forced to watch his sons executed, blinded, and then executed himself by the Babylonian Empire under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he lived through all that. Jeremiah watched and worried and warned his nation because he watched and was aware of his nation's wickedness. He watched his nation as it falsely claimed that it was living up to divine commands of faithfulness and justice. Jeremiah grieved because the rulers and the priests and the other prophets who were beholden to king after king and the ruling establishment were stubborn and hypocritical. He grieved because no matter how much he warned, his warnings were not heeded. And Jeremiah grieved because God ordained him to deliver a very inconvenient truth that the ruling establishment in his society refused to believe and did not want him to tell. That message, that inconvenient truth, was that Judah was out of time to make things right. God would not protect the nation any longer. God had set things in motion to bring Judah's time as an independent nation to an end. Instead, God ordered Jeremiah to proclaim the inconvenient truth that God had condemned the nation. He was not, God had not sent Jeremiah to send a God bless Judah message. Jeremiah could not end his sermons with God bless Judah. His message was that God had condemned Judah to a dreadful future. God would not prevent the Babylonian Empire from defeating Judah's military. Even worse, Jeremiah said that when the Babylonians came to defeat Judah, the Babylonians would be doing God's bidding. They would be executing God's judgment on a proud and disobedient nation. You've got to understand the irony of this. Babylonian was, an, in, was a pagan nation. Babylon in the era of that time was a pagan society and the irony is or was that Jeremiah was ordered to tell the people who believed themselves the chosen of God, God's favorites in their own mind, that God would use people that they looked down on. as God's agents of judgment. 
the conquering Babylonians would even plunder and burn the temple that Solomon had built centuries earlier in Jerusalem that they were so proud of. National leaders would be killed without mercy. Most of the population would be removed from the land and forced to live as exiles in Babylon. They would be depopulated. They would be dispossessed of their land. Jeremiah was ordered. He was, that's what we mean by ordained. He was ordered. When we say we ordain somebody, they are under orders. Jeremiah was under orders to deliver the grievous message that his nation, Judah, would suffer the loss of its land, the loss of its leadership, the loss of its religious life as part of God's judgment because of generations of societal idolatry and greed and hypocrisy and violence and injustice. Jeremiah was called to deliver inconvenient truth. So he was the weeping prophet because he lived in a painful time. He was a weeping prophet because he had to deliver painful messages. He was a weeping prophet because folks didn't want to hear his message. He was a weeping prophet because even folks who were kin to him hated him. Later in Jeremiah, we read that even his own kinfolks were trying to kill him. And Jeremiah didn't have the benefit of good family life. I've told you his kinfolks tried to kill him. Jeremiah didn't have a loving wife. He was not married. So he couldn't go home and get comfort from his spouse. That explains the stern and depressing tone of this passage we read together in Jeremiah chapter 5. We pick up the passage in the middle. But the passage begins with Jeremiah being told at verse 1 to search throughout Jerusalem, the capital city, and, quote, see if you can find one person who acts justly and seeks truth so that I can pardon Jerusalem. That's the context for these words. Go hunt for one person. And after Jeremiah had searched, we get the passage that we read. Declare this in the house of Jacob. Proclaim it in Judah. In other words, say it loudly. Announce it. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Do you see the question? It isn't that you are blind because of visual impairment, you refuse to see. It isn't that you are deaf because your ears are messed up, you refuse to hear. And then this question, do you not fear me, says the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? Don't read that word fear as God being mean. Read that word fear as if, don't you respect that you're not God? <laughs> and to use the example more graphically, we have these words, I place the sand as a boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. In other words, have you, have you not learned anything from the sea? 
Have you not learned anything from the ocean? And then this word at verse 23. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. In other words, you don't respect me. I'm the source of your rain. I'm the source of the water that you depend upon for your food. You don't respect me. And then this word at verse 25, your iniquities have turned these away. In other words, it stopped raining cause, because you live in a moral creation. And the laws of nature are subservient to the laws of God's justice. So that if your conduct in my moral creation is so unjust long enough, even nature gets sick of you. Even nature goes on strike. And then verse 26, for scoundrels are found among my people. They take over the goods of others. Like fowlers, they set a trap. They catch human beings. And I think of mass incarceration. I think of people who set debt traps for people. Making folks get into debt that is more than they can afford because they have to go into debt because we won't let them have health care that they can afford, so they have to go into debt. <sighs> Note the word scoundrels. Like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of treachery. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. In other words, they're not great and rich because they're healthy. This is sick fatness. This is sick wealth. This is sinful wealth. They are rich and ruthless. They are rich and wicked. They are wealthy, not because they're just, they're wealthy because they're wicked. They know no limits in deeds of wickedness. In other words, they don't know how to stop. They're addicted to it. They do not judge with justice the cause of the orphan to make it prosper. They do not defend the rights of the needy. And then this question, shall I not punish them for these things, said the Lord? And shall I not bring retribution on a nation such as this? We don't read these words in the lectionary for us to get preached on very often. So I had to go out of the lectionary readings. For this. In the three-year lectionary readings, you, you don't find this passage. You know why? Because the writers of the, the, writers of the lectionary, lectionary community know that Folks don't like to come to church to hear this. They don't want to come to church to hear the preacher tell them about a society like Judah. It seems too much like. Us. It's inconvenient truth. It ain't happy. It ain't God is good all the time. God, God, all the time, God is good. <laughs> uh, widen my territories. 
He's blessing me. He blessed me because he made me rich. He blessed me because I got more than I can handle. He's blessed me because I had a new sale. I bought stuff. <laughs> Faithfulness to God's demands that prophetic people tell the truth. Even when that truth is inconvenient. Faithfulness to God demands that we declare God's inconvenient truth to a deceitful and unjust nation like Judah. Several years ago, there was a cartoon strip called Pogo, and there was this memorable quote from Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. God has not called us to be the counselors or the cheerleaders to our deceitful nation. Oh, I know preachers love getting invited to go offer invocations at great ceremonies. We love getting invited to the governor's mansion, to the mayor's office, or to the White House, and do this, that, and the third. We love to get our pictures made with the politicians, but God hadn't called us in this age to be cheerleaders and counselors to our deceitful and unjust nation. God has not called us to conceal God's judgment sentence on state-sanctioned denial and deceit and hypocrisy and evil conduct. And make no mistake, the hypocrisy and deceit and injustice we see is state sanctioned. It is systemic. It is not accidental. It isn't happening because of something in the nature. It's happened because we have set it up this way. No matter how much prophetic people may love our nation, no matter how much we may prefer to, prefer to avoid delivering inconvenient truth about divine judgment, and no matter how much we want to avoid resentment and mistreatment from people because we deliver inconvenient truth, faithfulness to God, I say it again, faithfulness to God impels that we declare God's inconvenient truth to our nation. And so look at somebody and say it's time. Look at somebody and say it's time. It's time for people who are faithful to God. It's time for prophetic people in the United States to declare the dreadful message to our society that Jeremiah declared to Judah. It is time. And make no mistake. The message we must proclaim is not popular because it is so dreadful. Make no mistake, the message that we have proclaimed is not that America is going to get better. I am not here to tell you, happy days are here again. You remember that song, happy days are here again? No. I'm not here to preach that message. We will learn, as Jeremiah did, that our message will offend people, including people we know, including people we respect, including people we love. People will be offended because they do not like and do not want to hear inconvenient truth. They don't want to see inconvenient truth. They don't want to admit inconvenient truth. And they don't want to heed inconvenient truth. And because they cannot strike out at God, they must hit the messengers. You understand? They can't. Somebody wrote a book several years, your arm's too short to box with God. They, they can't box with God 
but they can pick on the people who are faithful to God in delivering God's message. Martin Luther King Jr. was hounded, threatened, subjected to painful criticism throughout his last years. Some of his critics were religious leaders. Let me in on a little secret. Most black religious leaders and most black congregations refused to be associated with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Oh, we have our Black History Month observances now, Martin Luther King days now. But when King was alive, folks couldn't bring up King's name in our worship services because our preachers didn't want to have anything to do with King. Whether you were Baptist, Methodist, Church of God in Christ, Church of Christ, Catholic, or anything else. Most black churches didn't want to have a thing to do with Martin King. The leaders of independent black nominations did not support the SCLC. Martin Luther King was run out of the National Baptist Convention, stripped of all his offices. He, was, he held an office in the National Baptist Congress, and he was stripped of his office. In some cases, black preachers and black congregations join forces with white preachers and congregations. Folks like Jerry Falwell. They did. To denounce King's demonstrations against U.S. racism and capitalism and warmongering. Since his assassination in 1968, Politicians and preachers and others have paid lip service to King's prophetic life. and They pimped his prestige at every turn, but that doesn't mean they follow his teachings. We have our Martin Luther King days, and we still wonder if I had to go buy shopping. King talked about consumerism as a danger for our society. When's the last time you heard most congregations say, don't go buy stuff because you really don't need it? We need to be giving us stuff away. If we got more stuff than we need, we ought not to be buying. We need to be using the money to give to people who don't have enough. Meanwhile, the gap between the people who are wealthy and the people who are poor is wider now than it was when King was murdered. Meanwhile, the United States now is not only leading the world in making war outside its borders, we are killing each other inside our borders with guns. We are using military-grade weapons against each other. And we are having people arguing about the fact that we want to buy them. But <laughs> Folks who won't send their children to go fight with M16s are going to go down to the arms dealers to go buy M16s and give them to their children to kill folks with. We're killing one another by poisoning the air and the water and the soil that, pro pro that produces the food we consume and therefore we are raising food that's sick and getting sick from the food we eat and getting sick from the water we drink idolatry to the, degree, to the greed inherent in capitalism. I said the greed inherent in capitalism. Haven't you noticed how much the politicians are now saying, we won't say capitalism, we won't capitalism, we won't capitalism. We don't hear anybody talking about the greed inherent in capitalism. Do you know why slavery worked? It was built on capitalism. <laughs> Capitalism base, it ba it requires that you basically use as much of whatever you can get for as little as however you can pay for it to get as much back as you want. <laughs> so you can take as much out of the earth as you want to. No matter how much it hurts the earth. Because you can make money. 
You can steal the labor of other people no matter how much you must oppress them because it makes you money. You can cheat people of the health care they need and require them to pay more than they have to pay because it makes you money. And we love it because the stock market is going up. Everybody brags about the stock market. There's something kind of sick about bragging about a system that's killing your neighbors. People are sick and dying, and we are bragging. Idolatry to the greed inherent in capitalism has blinded our entire society from seeing the harm caused by generations of devotion to profit making rather than building community. This nation was built on wage theft, land theft. Don't get it twisted. We are not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We are the land of the thieves and the home of the violent. People are sick and dying in our society because they cannot afford mental and physical health care and treatment, not because we don't have enough money to provide it, but because the United States economy is built on greed, not on health. It is built on keeping enough folks sick that people have to get the medicine and keeping the people so broke they have to go in debt to keep the medicine and making them have to get the medicine even though the system can be changed so they can get the medicine free. So now is not the time for prophetic people to be quiet. This is not the time for us to sit nice and quietly in church. and say, let's just all sing and pray. And then hope the Lord make it better. Now is not the time for us to seek favorable attention from the deceitful and hypocritical and unjust politicians and their corporate sponsors. I hadn't planned on saying this, but I think I will say it anyway. Now is not time for us to be quiet about how the mayor of this city decided to support a billionaire who is an Islamophobe who, as mayor, sent police to spy on Muslim mosques. Now is not the time for people to be quiet about the mayor of this city deciding to endorse a billionaire who was a racial profiler before he ran for president and was proud about it, but when he started running for president, he said, I I, I was wrong. Now is not the time for us to be quiet about supporting a mayor, about a mayor who supports a billionaire, who supported redlining before he ran for president. But now he's running for president, he's, he's supposed to be helping us talk about the wealth gap. The wealth gap he created? Now is the time for us to speak and act like Jeremiah spoke and acted. Now is the time for us to say of this society what Jeremiah said of Judah. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule as the prophets direct. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? Without a doubt, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in this land. And as prophetic people, it is our duty to God to say to this society, 
the same thing that Jeremiah said to his society. And to ask our society, what will you do before God does to this society what God let happen to Judah? However, we must not fool ourselves. Sooner or later, look at somebody and say, sooner or later. Sooner or later, people who feed a death wish, like the death wish that Judah fed, find a way, as Judah did, to destroy themselves. Sooner or later, say something like sooner or later, people who feed a death wish find a way to destroy themselves. Sooner or later, People who lie to themselves long enough find a way to lie themselves to death. Sooner or later, people who make themselves sick enough find a way to poison themselves to death. Sooner or later, people who elect folks who lie to them and then keep electing folks because they like the lies and then keep electing the lying electors, find a way to elect themselves to death. And when that happens, don't say if, when that happens, don't say God didn't tell you so. Because remember the title of this message? Facing an old, inconvenient truth. This is not man bites dog. That's news. Man bites dog is news. Dog bites man is not news. This is not news. This is old, inconvenient truth. Judge of creation, we are like Jeremiah in a society like Judah. We see evidence of idolatry to greed and deceit and injustice at every turn. Oh God, we see commercial robbery licensed as economic good. We see capitalist self-centeredness preferred to communal well-being. We see manufactured and merchandised and marketed violence. We see the suffering this has caused in our time. We know the suffering it has caused across the history of this nation. And we know that our nation has not heard your prophets. Our nation has rejected your prophets in favor of politicians and priests and prophets who spin lies that the people have chosen to believe. We cannot blame you for our plight. This is the mess that people, including a majority of the religious leaders and congregations, have chosen. So we pray that you would strengthen us to proclaim your stern, let loving, loving message of judgment to our nation. Deliver us from a spirit of fear and timidity and concern about being unpopular. Help us to hear your voice, to see your ways, and declare your truth with clarity and strength so that whether the people of our time listen or not, see or not, and heed or not, they will know that we have been your people, your prophetic people in their presence. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the prophet who called us to love you faithfully and love one another generously. Amen. Our house today is actually a congregational hymn in your uh, Red Hymn book, page 632. And I would like to ask you to stand to sing this. And I want you to sing as though Sing it triumphantly. I want to hear those voices. Amen. 
Amen.